This episode of this Focused Practical Dreamer's Journey is brought to you by energy healer Jean Borders' personal powerful transformation program. Know you're leaving money on the table but can't figure out how to bring it in? Need to double your productivity and profitability? Need an extra push to get things moving in the right direction? Visit www.focusedpracticaldreamer.com slash transformation now and apply for a business consultation with Jean. Welcome to the Focused Practical Dreamer's Journey, where we take out your emotional baggage and heal your emotional body so you get to enjoy the success you desire and deserve. Prepare to feel a sense of relief and empowerment as we get rid of the baggage you've been carrying that's held up your business success up until now. Be sure to visit our website at www.focusedpracticaldreamer.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, lean in, get comfortable, and prepare to take off. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Jean Border with the Focus Practical Dreamer's Journey podcast. I hope everyone is doing well. I'm so excited to be here with you today with my special guest, Vanessa Cardenas. She is a betrayal specialist, which I, I find fascinating. Um, betrayal in personal realm and also in the business realm. That covers so much. So, uh, hi, Vanessa. How are you? Jean, I'm wonderful today on this crisp day. Mm. Yes, I know. I've got my sweater on because we were discussing earlier, it's a little bit chilly where I am. I'm in the Midwest, and and it's a little bit chilly today, and such is life, right? Exactly. exactly. So tell me a little bit about you and this betrayal mm. um, topic and how you came upon this as your life's work. Yes. Well... Um, very interesting that I came upon it. Um, I can say this. Nobody, no one studies betrayal unless they've been through it. And I, I was addicted to certainty. I was addicted to the certainty of life, that if I did everything right in my life, that I checked off all of the boxes, that I would be somewhat inoculated towards bad things happening to me. I don't know where I came up with the idea. Maybe, you know, Disney movies kind of just gave you that vision of a perfect life. And I thought I had a perfect life. And I went through my life happy-go-lucky until one day my husband sat me down on a, in a park bench in Central Park and said, Vanessa, I need to talk to you. And then I turned to look at him just as I normally did any other time. And he said three words that completely shattered me. I've met someone. And my whole world completely shattered. I could not believe the words coming out of his mouth. Um, if you ever watched Peanuts cartoons when you were a child, wah, 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 wah of the adults, that's what I heard from that moment on. I couldn't hear anything else. I couldn't understand how it was that I did everything right. I went to a good school, I got good grades, I got a good career, I went up the corporate ladder of C-suite executive, there I was, and my whole world completely fell apart. And I remember distinctly laying on my bedroom floor in tears, not understanding why I was feeling so much pain, and just asking God, source, spirit, please, if I can get through this, if I can get a reprieve from feeling like this, that I promised that I would help someone else. And sure enough, the next day, I felt a little better and a little better after that and so forth and so on. And then I got that nudge, that nudge, you made a promise. And I dove deep into betrayal recovery. And I did it for intimate partner betrayal. And there was a moment in time during my C-suite career that I had a colleague come into my office close the door. I need to talk to you. And I was very taken back by the experience. And she started to explain what was going on with her and a work colleague that she felt betrayed 
by this work colleague. And here I am sitting across the desk from her thinking to myself, wow, she's experiencing all the same emotions that I had from intimate partner betrayal, but she's feeling that from a colleague, a work colleague. And that caused a shift in me to realize betrayal happens in so many different settings. It doesn't just happen in an intimate partner relationship. It happens in all types of relationships. And it really got me thinking about that aspect of betrayal, like just as a whole. And I started to study it from that perspective. And I discovered so many things on that journey. And the most important for me personally was the reason that my intimate partner betrayal hurt so much from my beloved was that I had all of these little betrayals in my past that I never recognized as betrayal. I just thought they were just eh, things that happened. And I, can, I could go back to memories of being a 12-year-old with a dog walking service. I had a dog walking service around my neighborhood. And I remember distinctly one afternoon, I had to go around and collect my weekly pay. I brought my friend Sarah with me because she was my best friend. We had been friends forever. And I brought her along. And suddenly she struck up a conversation with one of my clients, my clients, my people at the time. And she started walking that person's dog rather than me. Wait a second. Now you're walking Mrs. Smith's dog, you know, and then suddenly, slowly but surely, she started to go from from each house to each house that were mine, offering her service for less than what I was charging. And suddenly she took away all my clients, all my people. I was 12 years old and I didn't recognize that as a betrayal. I recognized it as my best friend took my business. And I remember that so distinctly. And now, because I've gone through the recovery process and the training that I've ensued, I realized the shift that happened, that I didn't speak up for myself, that I didn't say anything, that my silence equaled acceptance. And that was a very hard lesson for me to learn then, which I didn't learn then, but in my 50s, I learned that. And I was like, wow. That's really, really very interesting. And that caused me to start exploring betrayal in business. Mm. Yeah. Wow. It happens a lot. Wow. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's very funny. As my guests come on, as they start speaking, I'm like, okay, trying to relate it back to my life. That kind of, you know, I guess that's kind of normal. Um, and I don't have the same experiences as you, the intimate partner betrayal absolutely um i think we had different reactions but that is not something i would wish on anybody it's just a devastating thing to go through it really is um talk to me about this rear window view what is that called you were, you were talking about mm. in 2017 um i stumbled upon on YouTube, I stumbled upon a YouTube video about the hindsight window. Hindsight window. Right, the hindsight window. It's kind of similar to the theory that when you're driving, you're looking through your windshield, which is huge, and then you have your rear view mirror, which is small. Why? Because that's the past. That's the past. Yes, you should glance at it, but you shouldn't be watching it. You should be looking forward on your windshield. So I stumbled across this video that really spoke to me. 20 minutes of pure wisdom wasn't related to betrayal. It was just related to life in general, that you have your present, you have your future, and you have your past. And if your hindsight window, meaning the event that happens, the devastating event that happens. And when you finally get to the point where you see it for the gift or the opportunity or the 
it was meant to be, and I'm cautious when I say that, that it was meant to be because that event was the catalyst that changed the trajectory of your life. It absolutely did that. You can pinpoint where you are today by going back in time and realizing that pivotal moment, that pivotal moment where you turned a corner, where you made a decision, where you decided enough is enough, whatever it was, you pivoted, you made a shift and your life is completely different. Had you stayed on the path, you would have just continued. And I found that so inspirational. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to use this for betrayal. I have to use this for betrayal. And I started to incorporate it into my private practice with intimate partner betrayal. But then as I discovered this whole other realm of business betrayal, I started to incorporate it in that as well. And again, what it is, is we want to shorten the window of that suffering that we have, that that catalyst, that event, that devastating event, that we get to the point where we realize that had to happen. As, as painful as it was, it was the necessary shove that you needed to move in a different direction. And I don't refer to it as a lesson learned because when we learn a lesson, eh, it still has this emotional uh, on it this guilt, this shame, this remorse. No, this is a shove that you need to step into who you were actually meant to be. It's, it's this, uh, yes, here it is. Here's what you can do. And for me personally, I took that shove into entrepreneurship. I was like, wow, this is wonderful. I love this opportunity to be an entrepreneur, to step into a role that I suddenly felt I was meant to do. I was meant to be someone else's survival guide. But now, as an entrepreneur, I needed to be careful about betrayal in business because there are instances where betrayal rears its ugly head in entrepreneurship, not only in regular business, corporate environments, and things of that nature. But when you're starting out your own business, there are things that you need to watch out for, just cautionary tales. So the top three types of betrayal in business are definitely a friend turns competitor. That was my case. I didn't even see it like that. But yes, your friend turns into a competitor. The second one is intellectual property theft. Now, this is a big one. This is massive. You, as an entrepreneur, have this wonderful creative idea, product, whatever it is, and now you're thinking of hiring contractors, people to come into your business to help you sell it, to help you craft your, your website, your, your sales funnel, whatever it might be, but you're bringing people in to your realm you're sharing your intellectual property. And if you don't have anything in place, oof, it's gone. That's betrayal. That is betrayal. And then the third is employee misconduct. Ooh. And that can be definitely fraud, embezzlement, things of that nature. Again, when you're a solo entrepreneur, you're keeping kind of everything tight. But as you grow, you're going to need people. You're going to need to trust those people. You're going to need to hire well. You're going to make sure that you have systems in place, backups of backups of backups, to make sure that your employees don't feel a sense of a entitlement, that they're entitled to something within your business because they helped create it and you don't have anything formalized that says, this is my idea. This is mine. This is my intellectual property. Thank you for helping me cultivate it, but it still belongs to me. It's not yours. So those are the three top that really come into play as I start to speak to entrepreneurs that reluctantly come to me because they don't want to admit that they've been betrayed. 
And I hadn't thought of it using the word betrayal, but you are absolutely right. For me, it's a matter of trust or broken trust when it comes to, that's the way I had viewed it in the business world. Right. You trust your employees to be a good, uh, avatar is overused, to be a good face for your company, right? And if they don't represent you well, oh my goodness, the ramifications of that, you know? It's like, so sometimes you have to say, talk to people as if I was in the room with you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, that's, that, that sounds terrible to say, but sometimes that gets the point across. If I was in the room with you, is that how you would be speaking to these people, to these customers, to these clients, right? Correct. But you have to trust your employees. And once the trust is broken, that's really hard to come back from. Because how do they how do they then prove themselves worthy, if you will, of your trust? Oh my gosh, so much wrapped around that just that part of it. Never mind the embezzlement, which is, you know, overblown lack of trust, right? You put your trust in the wrong person. Something that came to mind when you were talking about that was as a as someone just be just getting into the place of growing their business past where they can handle all the, the nitty-gritty details. You have to be able to trust a VA with even passwords to things, right? Even that can be a minefield. If you yes. get the wrong VA, they can they can destroy whatever they have access to, which is where the backups are so critical. <laughs> all right. And now that we're also dealing with virtual assistants, who are in other countries. Yes. Laws are very different yes. than here in the U.S. because you and I are both based in the U.S. You know, your legal ramifications, your legal protections might not protect you for somebody that you have overseas. And you need to properly vet the people that you have and keep those controls. As entrepreneurs, we sometimes become very laxed because we enjoy the nitty gritty of our business and seeing it grow and the birth and everything. And we think that the people around us have that same passion, that same oomph. It's it's similar to when you have a baby. You, you love your baby, this and that, and somebody else shows the same appreciation for your child. And you're like, wow, they're a perfect nanny. We're both, you know, uh, focused on this baby and we both get up at night and we both work the midnight oil and we both, you know, we create and we do and it's wonderful and this and that. And the other person starts to think that they're, it's part, it's theirs too. And we get, we, we cross a line. The line becomes very, very blurry and that's when things happen. And suddenly, just like a rubber band, we're snapped back of Oh my God, this is me. This is my bit. This isn't your business. And it's really very, very challenging. You mentioned about trust. You know, that person can leave the business. Usually they do. But the new people that come in, your heart is so hardened by the experience that you're almost paralyzed and you suddenly take on all the responsibilities that you were letting go of as you created your business and get your business off the ground, you can't do it all. You absolutely can't do it all. So you started to give things away, in a sense, to others, responsibilities, you delegated, you trained, everything else, and then suddenly this happens, and your first instinct is to take it all back from everybody else because your heart is hardened. and. That's where I come into play. I work not only with the entrepreneur themselves, but also with their teams to talk about that trust factor, to talk about transparency, to make sure that you're being transparent, that you're spelling out exactly what you're doing and you understand your role, that everybody has a very distinct role in what they are doing and that they understand. Then, of course, there are contracts and things to put into place, non-disclosure non, uh, agreements, things of that nature. So there is a legal aspect. But again, when you're just starting off your business, you don't think of those things. You don't because you're so intoxicated with the newness of it. And this is going to be great. And we're going to have so much fun. And we're going to make such an 
impact on people because that's really what entrepreneurship is. It's the three things. You want to have fun. You want to make an impact. And you want to be profitable. I know some people don't like to talk about profit, but you do need to be profitable to keep going. So fun, impact, profitable. I like those. I do. Well, and that's a conversation I have with a lot of clients because in the beginning, they just don't even think about setting boundaries, right? This is your role. This is my role. They work with a client and the client will call. I work with younger healers as well to helping them set up their their business and and grow their confidence in what they're doing. But they will have some of their clients that have like almost 24-7 access to them. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is so unhealthy for you. Never mind that your client now, not on purpose probably, but as a matter of habit, takes huge advantage of you and uses you like, like you're attached to them. So they don't become strong because they keep depending on you to bail them out or whatever it is, right? So boundaries are hard for people to determine initially and then in the in the early phases to actually adhere to. <laughs> so, yes. Entrepreneurs, as we start out, we do everything. Like you said, we do everything. We have to learn how to create the website or farm it out, but farming it out is kind of scary, right? Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to set up a calendar and set up all the kind of scheduling we want and who we want to be able to schedule what type of meetings and how much control am I going to give somebody else over my world? How much am I going to charge? That money piece is huge. And when it, when it comes to betrayal, um, if someone has cost you income that that can be a big one to get over uh -huh. it's emotional is huge but money is up there also because money is an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people like you were saying uh -huh. um we don't want to say oh i need to make a profit i should just give away my services for free well then who's going to pay your mortgage exactly who's going to make your car payment who's going to buy your groceries and pay for the heat in your house it is up to you to determine what is acceptable, what boundaries you're not willing to cross. And if one of them is not going low, less than what you need to live and thrive financially, then you have to determine what that is and stick to your guns. And that's hard sometimes. Oh, so difficult. So very challenging, especially when you have so much baggage in the background. And a lot of what I work with clients on is that baggage in the background because I'm a firm believer that resentment and regret in your past equals fear in your future. But if you're able to clean up those resentments and those regrets, gratitude for your past will equal faith in your future because you will have built up that resistance to know that you can handle things, that you can handle, that you can be prepared in the present. In the present moment, you can prepare yourself and then you will have faith in the future that it'll work out. Absolutely, very much so. So when it comes to betrayal, you know, what have you learned from the experience? Rather than it hardening your heart, what have you learned? Up, oh, this person had access to this based on this password, based on this role. They had access, full administrative access. Well, let me contact the company or whatever software that is and see if there's a role below that. You know, it, it, there's a situation where I don't allow my salespeople to interact with accounting. Why? A lot of people ask me that because the salesperson is the one who makes the sale and has the direct contact with the client, okay? Let's say we're talking about a product, okay? You supply a product and the sales rep makes that connection, gets that order, the order is fulfilled, now the client is delayed on pain. I don't want my sales reps contacting that client asking for money. Why? 
because the sales rep is always to be on the side of the client. They're the client advocate. If they start calling for money, that means that anytime the client sees that number, that name pop up, no, I don't want to talk to them because they think that the sales rep is calling about money. No, you have to keep them distinct and separate. You also have to keep them distinct and separate for that betrayal checklist that you go through and determine that my sales rep who knows what the invoices are isn't going to be handling the money. You want to make sure that you have triple checks in your processes to avoid the opportunity for betrayal. And that does happen. Um, I don't want to use the word frequently, but it does happen enough in business that it is definitely a concern. Uh -huh. um, a, a case recently, one of my clients, her general contractor was charging her X dollars for a certain skilled trade that was coming in per hour. And when that relationship started to get rocky and she spoke to that professional tradesperson about if if the general contractor is no longer in the picture, can we work together? And he's like, yeah, sure, at the same X number dollar rate. And it was so much less than what the contractor was charging her for that. So the trust factor is no longer there. But this general contractor had full control over all the communications with her and all the communications with the professional tradesperson. And now both of those people no longer trust this contractor because the tradesperson was being cheated and the homeowner was being treated, cheated. So what's that going to do for this general contractor's future business? Exactly. Definitely no referrals coming there. Nope. Nope. And everything is based on referrals. Mm -hmm. And it takes, it takes one instance to break trust. And trust is built over time. It is brick by brick, layer by layer, but it can be destroyed in an instant. Yes. And it's really hard to build that back up. And it takes a long time. It's the same thing with personal integrity and, and your sense of self. And that's what a lot of entrepreneurs need to keep in mind is their own integrity. So when they discover betrayal amongst their company and they address it, and that's where the most difficult challenge is, is how to address it and then how to pick up the pieces of the rest of your business. Whether you have other team members that don't know about the betrayal and you need to communicate with them in a way that is reinforcing your commitment to your own company, but also kind of setting the stage, setting the roles, setting the boundaries of what you expect. And expectations are really hard to define verbally or even in writing what exactly you expect from someone else because we all have this general idea, but you and I might have a difference of opinion of what an expectation is, of what this role is responsible for. And it's really about setting the stage really being very crystal clear on exactly what you want and what you expect as the CEO, the founder, the the entrepreneur of your business. And it's 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 so rewarding, but it does come with risks and you want to mediate those risks. You want to be able to anticipate them and get your processes in place and your procedures in place to avoid it, to preempt betrayal, not have it happen. Have those conversations with your employees to see how they are doing, how they are feeling. Is there something in their background, something in their own personal lives that might cause them to betray you? For example, there was a great, great example that happened, and I read about it in the journal, about the number two, number two guy, been with the company for decades. Number two guy, the, the CEO's right hand from, from, the, from the garage to the C-suite. And what happened was his wife got cancer. 
They didn't say anything. They wanted to do experimental um, medicine for it. And he started embezzling from the company. And the CEO, I remember it, that the article so distinctly, you know, had said, you know, he was my friend. We had been friends for 40 years. We built this company. He was my number two. Why didn't he come to me? Personally, I would have helped him. Why did he feel it necessary to steal from me? Not even to steal from me, to steal from us, to steal from the company. And he was so hurt by that ex exchange, by that experience, because it was his friend. But then he had to put the, the, the walls around him and realize my role as CEO, your role is number two. And embezzling is not right. And they went to court. They went to court over it. A friendship destroyed because of a lack of communication, a lack of actually feeling like he was be able to talk and say what's going on in his life. So I always advise a lot of my clients who are just starting out, get to know your people, get to know them, talk to them, have that type of personal relationship so that if something transpires in their life, you know about it and you can help on a personal level before they take from you. Big lesson there. Yes, very, very much so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question that you need to ask yourself when you experience betrayal is, could you be better for the experience? Could you be better for the experience? And I know that that's really difficult to answer when you're in the thick of it and you feel that betrayal and you feel all of those emotions. But I invite you to remember the, the best story of all is Steve Jobs. You know, he created Apple with Steve in the garage and they went on and this and that and, you know, created Apple and everything was going really well. But Steve Jobs got ousted by his board. His board of directors, people he put into place, pushed him out. Yeah, that's a big betrayal. He came back and the rest is history. Same thing with Walt Disney. One of Walt Disney's very first characters, way before Mickey Mouse, got swiped from him. He lost the rights to it. Now, he didn't, you know, roll over and play dead. He picked himself up and realized, can I be better for the experience? And Walt Disney is, what, celebrating 100 years this year? Yeah. So you can bounce back from betrayal. You know, it, it'll change you, but don't let it harden your heart. Because it's your heart that has that entrepreneurial spirit in it. Don't, don't put a, a um, barbed wire or, or a... Uh, brick wall around it because you're stifling yourself. Don't do that. Step into it and realize, you know what? I will be better for this experience. I use the word intention a lot. Mm -hmm. Determine what your intention is for the future in those situations. Do you want to stay in the same emotions that you're in? Is that the world you want to live in? Is that the soup you want to swim in? Or do you see something different for the future? Mm -hmm. And if you do, how can you get from where you are to where you want to be? And a lot of that, you something you mentioned before, is getting rid of the old baggage that you're carrying around from that event. You're not going to forget it happened. You're going to you're going to maybe determine some areas where you could shore up internal controls or whatever, more checks and balances in your system. So that's not a possibility to that extent in the future. People are always going to find ways to cheat if they want to, right? Yes. But all you can do is mitigate as, as much as is appropriate for your situation. And if it does happen again in another way, reevaluate just like anything. You, you take all the measures that you can, you take the proper steps, you reevaluate if something occurs, you tweak 
whatever measures you had in place or you add some or you take some away. It's just a growing process. It's not a great process to go through, but it is a growing process. But set the intention for what you want to be true for your future or your company's future. If you want it to be profitable, decide that it's going to be. See what's not in place that has you there already. You know, become aware of where you are, focus on what you want, and then take strategic action to get you from where you are to where you want to be. I mean, that's that's really what it is. You you make course corrections along the way, but every step you're moving closer and closer to what your intention is for your company or your personal life. Uh -huh. Same principles apply to both. We just use different language. Yes. Right? Very, very true. Yeah. So intention is big. Oh, yeah. Setting the intention and making the decision that that will be true. Mm -hmm. You mentioned another phrase, addiction to certainty. Mm. Talk to me about that. To me, that means staying stuck in a habit or stuck in a rut. What do you mean by addiction to certainty? Uh, for me, um, I believe that we all have a set of expectations for ourselves. That if we do X, we will get Y. If we do Y, we will get Z. And it's just a pattern of this for that, this for that, this for that, this for that. And I was addicted to the certainty of, well, if I did this, I would get this. And if I did this, I would get this. And I wasn't ready for the uncertainty. And I now love the uncertainty. I love the what happens happens situation. And I've grown to love that. Whereas I was raised, you do this, this happens. You do this, this happens. And that expectation, so similar to what you said about a pattern, but I was comfortable in the patterns. I was comfortable in knowing that if I did X, I would get Y. And if I wanted Y, I needed to do X in order to get there. So there was this... Um, list of rules that I had implemented for myself, by myself, based on what I thought society wanted for me. Uh, let me give you an example. My hair. Uh, and the reason that I smile is that my hair has always been um, something that I've been very proud of. Um, I had hair halfway down my back. It was salt and pepper, earned, because grays are earned. And I had bangs. And I had this hairstyle for decades. Then when I went through my own personal trauma with my husband and infidelity, I started, because I wanted to control something, I chopped my hair to my shoulders. And that was huge. Everybody noticed it. Then I dyed it all brown. Mm, that was noticeable. People were commenting, wow, you look 10 years younger. You know, And I never really paid any attention. It was just hair type of thing. Then one of the um, discoveries, when you deal with intimate partner betrayal, you have your discovery day when you find out about the infidelity. And then you subsequently have what I refer to as trickle truths, where things start to come out that you didn't know later on during the healing process. So you have multiple discovery days where you find out a little bit more about your partner than you realized. And with each discovery day, I did something to my hair. So I shaved off a side. Then I shaved off the other side. Then I added the pink. Now, you have to keep in mind, I'm a C-suite executive as well. And here I am walking into boardrooms with pink in my hair. Um, but I now stepped into myself. And the thing that I can say about hair as a trauma response was, this was years ago. I haven't done anything to my hair in years. Why? There's no more trauma. There's no more trauma. I don't need to control a situation. And when I mentioned that I'm addicted to certainty, I was addicted to being in control of something. That if I did this, I would get that. And it was a sense of control. And now I enjoy the uncertainty of life. That each day just presents itself and I just roll with it. And there's such freedom in that, that you just, ah, oh, you take a nice deep breath, you let it out, and you go, okay, 
I'm ready. I'm ready. What could that look like in the business world? Entrepreneurs, how could they realize what what could they look for to see if that is something they need to maybe consider? Yeah, with a lot of the entrepreneurs that I work with that wear many, many hats, it, it goes against the grain, but I tell them to slow down, to pause, to stop chasing the next thing, to relish in what they have already accomplished, and to sit in that for a couple of moments and feel that wash over them. Perfect example that I use with my clients is I mentioned about being on podcasts such as yours. Years ago, my very first podcast that I got invited on, oh, I was nervous. Oh, oh, oh I was shaking. And I did it. And I so loved the experience. I couldn't wait for the next one. And I have a coach and a guru that I um, confide in. And I mentioned that. And I said, oh, my God, it was such a great experience. I loved it. And I said, I can't wait for the next one. And he said, no, 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 no. You can't do another one for six weeks. What do you mean six weeks? I want to do it like tomorrow. I want to, I want to feel this feeling again. And he says to me, you're feeling it now. Enjoy the feeling now. Sit in it for a while. Enjoy it. Don't look for the next thing to get that high again, you already got the high. Savor it. Enjoy it. Take it all in. And that was the best piece of advice for me then because I, I look at that for everything else. When I've accomplished something in my business that just makes me glow, that I'm so ridiculously proud of, whether it's something that I did or something that one of my team members do, we sit in it, we savor it, we celebrate it. And then we move on. It's not, oh, that was great, what's next? No, pause, enjoy that feeling. The energy within you will motivate you towards the next thing days, weeks, months later. Savor it. And I'm laughing because that is so true. Okay, that's done. What's next? That's done. What's next? That's done. What's next? Th that's done. I can tell you right now, and this this part of it is just me. It's the way I think. I can't stand to be bored. I, I can't, right? I don't have ADHD, none of that stuff, but I, I need to be involved in multiple things in order to be okay with me, I guess. I That's not really right. I like to be interested in a lot of things. I have probably 12 different classes I'm in right now. Now they're study classes, so I can do them as I get interested in one or the other, right? So there's no firm end date, but I finish one, it's like, okay, which one's next? And I tell my clients all the time, we're going to create milestones. And when you hit this milestone, what are you going to do to celebrate it, right? Because if you go watch a football game, when somebody gets, I mean, they're just moving a ball across a little white line, you know, underneath these funny looking poles that somebody decided was the right structure for a football game, for a football to go over or under, and the crowd goes crazy. Where is your crowd that's going crazy that you completed your first sale of that $2,000 product or whatever it is, right? That's big for an entrepreneur. A $2,000 sale? Oh, my gosh. But it's like, oh, yeah, I did it, but I, but I didn't get a $4,000 sale, or I didn't get three of them. Well, that, that internal satisfaction, we've let that go for production, for yeah. productivity, right? For saying, I did it, now what? Yeah. So celebration is a big deal. Oof, it absolutely is. And we do it, we do it with our children. We celebrate their birthdays, we celebrate their milestones, whatever it might be. We do that. And then somewhere along the line, we don't celebrate ourselves anymore. And as an entrepreneur, yes, celebrate your wins, celebrate your team's wins. You know, let them know that you appreciate them. 
so that they continue to work hard for you and that they continue to believe in your why, why you do what you do. And again, fun, impactful, profitable. And I'll keep those in, in that order, fun, impactful, profitable. And you can't go wrong with that. You absolutely can't. And what I want to instill in those that have been betrayed is hope that to hold on because the pain ends. It does. It just does. Don't let it harden your heart. Mm -mm. So I have a couple of things that I want to uh, stress to your audience. There are four legal practices that I recommend. Again, I'm not a lawyer. So first thing first, consult with a lawyer. When something happens, when one of those three types of betrayal happens, you want to consult with a lawyer. Um, you want to document everything, every, as minute as you think it is. Even if the person who betrayed you called and left a message, you write it down in your journal, your journal of your documentation of this entire situation, you jot that down. Even if you decide not to listen to the message, they left a message, didn't listen to it. Document, document, document. Because if this goes to mediation or a trial or anything of that nature, you're going to want to have a very big record of here's everything. You have done your due diligence in documenting everything. You then want to strengthen your contracts and your agreements. I know that a lot of people these days are using ChatGPT for a lot of variety of things. Don't trust ChatGPT for your legal documents. It can give you a good rough idea of what you should include in your documents, but that's what a lawyer is for. Have them take a look at your documents and really solidify them, especially if you are using virtual assistance from another country or anyone from another country. You want to make sure that you protect yourself. And the fourth thing is that you want to protect your intellectual property and your sensitive data. Your email list, that is an asset. You don't want that in somebody else's hands because they can single-handedly destroy your relationship by sending out an email saying what a difficult boss you were. And just like that, all of that hard work is wiped out. So you wanna make sure that you protect yourself. So those are four things to keep in mind. Again, not a lawyer, but the first one is to consult a lawyer. Yeah, the whole chat GPT, that's a, another discussion. Um, it is very good for a lot of things. I mean, I use it quite frequently for creating content from my stuff, mm -hmm. right? So that way it's not creating somebody else's stuff that I'm going to put my name on, which is another legal thing that, you know, the whole plagiarism thing that's coming out now from ChatGPT. But having access to a lawyer who knows your state, because state rules are different than federal rules, and has some knowledge of how your business interests with relation to, in relation to international assistance, whatever, right? That, that's a pretty interesting career path for attorneys, I think. Being well-versed in international law, how that works, in addition to state law and federal and it may require more than one attorney sometimes. Yes. Depending on what the subject matter is. Exactly. Exactly. So we've talked a lot about betrayal on the personal and the business front. Do you happen to have any tools that might be useful for our listeners when it comes to betrayal? Um, the roadmap that I use, that I like to use just in general, just to start off with, we dive deeper because just like relationships, every single relationship is completely unique. As unique as your fingerprint, so is recovery from betrayal. There's a uniqueness to it. It's not do this and do this. Again, the certainty of if you do X, you'll get Y. When you recover from betrayal, there's a lot of uncertainty because it really depends 
on your past baggage, how you're feeling at the present moment, and whether you have fear or faith in the future. But the first, I have four steps that I'd like to use. The first is to actually acknowledge the betrayal, like see it for what exactly it is. Because once you can identify it and name it, you then know how to work with it or on it. Um, I like to apply the hindsight window. Your past, your present, your future. Let's look at different situations from your past and shorten your hindsight window so that we can take a look at this devastating event of betrayal and see into the future with faith in the future of what this devastating event is actually going to do for you, how it's going to propel you forward. Again, the Steve Jobs example. Number three, you want to embrace your emotions. You don't want to bury them. You don't want to stifle them. You do need to get them out, up and out, so that you can experience that sense of rage that washes over you. It's fine. It's fine not to be okay. It absolutely is. I just don't want your body to become the coffin for all of those emotions. And then step four is to use it as motivation. Do something. Whether you enact the fourth uh, suggestions I made, consult a lawyer, get things in place, that thing. Use the betrayal as motivation to propel you forward, not to keep you stuck in the past and not to keep you cemented to the present. To propel you forward. I found that to be true for me that when I've experienced these things, it's a huge motivator. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it wasn't an I'll show them because I almost immediately took them out of my equation, if that makes sense. It does. You know, it's like I'm going to get back everything I think that person tried to take from me and I'm going to make it so far better, so much better than what was at that moment that, you know, it's almost like you're gone, (laughs) you know, (laughs) you're gone. I I will never trust you again. You're gone. Very interesting. The the reactions we have to events that occur in our lives and and, in our business, or if you're an employee, even at your job, you know, that's, I had one situation that was very interesting, and I, it has nothing. It does have something to do with this, or it wouldn't have popped into my head. But I was in a position of trust um, in Europe, and there was an attorney, believe it or not. That I, I did a lot of coordination between different. Um, I'm going to say disciplines, everything from all, all different types of management tracks, mm. but one of these. People was an attorney, and he put something in an email that, in my opinion, called into question my loyalty. And I was furious. And now, when these things happen to me, I'm not one who sits back and says, oh, poor me. I make decisions, and I respond, and I, I'm a little bit different there, I guess. Because my parents taught me, I had a very strong foundation, that I could do anything in this life that I chose to do. So anything in conflict with that didn't exist for me. So I was very lucky that way. But I went to the top attorney. <laughs> and now he apologized for the guy's actions, but that guy was dead to me. I All of his legal, any legal opinion he rendered, I, I just discounted. Absolutely everything about him, he was just dead to me. As And as I explored the situation, I was not the only female he'd done that to. And sometimes it comes down to what group someone respects or doesn't respect and who you respect and who you don't respect. And for me, when these betrayals happen, I immediately lose trust, but I also lose respect for every situation that I ever experienced with them. There is there is no more respect for the person, so that's my side effect of betrayal. I'm sure everyone else have everyone has their own reactions, their own experiences, but my pattern, if you will, seems to be the trust is gone, the respect is gone. Yeah, it's it's as I said, it happens in an instant. 
in a split second. Very much so. Mm. Yep, it reminds me of um, Victor Frankl. Uh, he wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Great quote, great book, but a great quote in it is when we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. Yeah, very much so. Ah, the things we experience throughout life. Yeah, and they stick with you, you know? So it's very important to acknowledge what you're experiencing and make it okay so that you don't hold on to it. Because so much of what I do with, with some of my clients is just releasing that, like, I'm going to use your term, releasing the old baggage that they've held on to. You know, they're carrying all their luggage with them. It's like, okay, sit the luggage down. Now see how much more quickly you can move through the train station or the airport or whatever it is, right? I mean, there's a different feel from carrying it all and from setting it down and moving. Travel light. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So you have an ebook that, that we're going to make available to people? Um, yes, absolutely. I can make that available to your listeners. I'll send you the link for that so that you yeah. add. And we'll put the link down below so that you don't have to remember all that stuff, guys. Mm -hmm. um, but is your company called Understanding Ear? Is that? Yeah. Pick up on that somewhere? Yes, yes. It actually comes from a Stephen King quote. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> People are very surprised when I say that. What, the horror, the horror author? And I'm like, yes, the horror author. But well, he's he's written a lot. Though. Oh, yeah, he has. He's brilliant. Absolutely. Very much so. But there was a book that I read in high school. It was a, a series of short stories. And one of them started with this very long quote. And I condense it. And I carried around this quote. I had tore it out of my book. I know, sacrilegious to tear a page out of a book, but it meant so much to me. And the quote, in short, reads, the hardest things to say are the most important things to say, not for the want of a teller, but for the want of an understanding ear. Oh. And it just resonated with me for decades. And when I went into this realm of entrepreneurship, it hit me like a thunderbolt when somebody, you know, a contractor said, well, what do you want your URL, your website to be? And I said, understanding ear. And he looked at me very strangely and he typed it in and he goes, it is available. He was shocked. He was shocked it was available. I was equally as shocked that I didn't have to wrestle it away from someone else. And I really enjoy getting emails from parents looking for an audiologist. Mm -hmm. which isn't me, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So understandingear.com is me because that's what I am. I'm an understanding ear. I know that it's so difficult and so challenging to come to the realization that you've been betrayed. And I know how that feels. And I know all of those emotions that you're going through. And I just want to be there to see you, to hear you, to feel all of those emotions with you and let you know you're not alone and there is hope um, because hold on, the pain will end. It absolutely will. I want to thank you so much for being here. This has been a great conversation. I love these conversations. I get to meet the best people. <laughs> this has been magical. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. So do you have any, I think you've probably just said them, but do you have any final words for the listeners? Anything else come to mind that that might be a benefit? Mm. Oh, there's so many different things, but what I would like to leave your audience with is not to be addicted to certainty, to just breathe, step into it, and just know that there's such beauty on the other side of betrayal. There absolutely is, and you will get through it. You absolutely will. And I look forward to seeing you on the other side. And that's gonna be it for this session. My guest was Vanessa Cardenas, and this is your host, Jean Border, with the Focus Practical Dreamers Journey podcast. See you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Focused Practical Dreamers Journey where we take out your emotional baggage and heal your emotional body 
so you get to enjoy the success you desire and deserve. Remember to visit our website at www.focusedpracticaldreamer.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Focused Practical Dreamer's Journey.